Hello, welcome back. Now let's look at the group statement of cash flow. So currency I is number seven. So the group statement of cash flow. I know that you have already studied the single company statement of cash flows already in the previous papers. But now let's look at the group, okay, cash flow statement. So first of all, then, what do I mean by statement of cash flow? As you can see, uh, as the picture here. Is cash is the king. So many business investors will be particularly focusing on the cash within a company because cash is not manipulated by the accounting policy as well as the estimate. Because we have to do those adjustments in this statement of cash flow. Uh, that's one thing I'd like to talk to you about. So secondly, it is not in every circumstances that the cash is not being manipulated by the management because in some circumstances we, we can still do that. For example, um, if we find out that the cash position within a company is not very good, and what we can do is well, we're going to dispose off the property plant equipment, for example, we're going to sell off those factories, sell off those land within our company to others, and we're going to get the cash. So if that's the case then, surely it will improve the liquidity position in the current period because what we can do is sell off those assets and get the cash but at the same time we will lose the capacity to operate our business in the long term so it's not good for our company's long term in other words so uh, I mean statement of cash flow cash is the king of course um, it would be the true wealth for those shareholders because it's not manipulated by the uh, accounting policy as well as the estimate the cash is not over or understated by those policies as well as the estimates, but to some extent, we can manipulate the cash within our company to improve the current liquidity position. So for the statement of cash flow then, we know cash is a good thing, but what do I mean by statement of cash flow then? So we've studied the statement of financial position in the previous chapters, and also the CSFP, it's the Consolidated Statement of Financial Position. And within that SFP, the current asset section under which there will be cash and cash equivalent. So as you can see, if we've got two years statement of cash flow for example we've got the opening balance which is the closing balance from last year let's say is to be hundred dollars of cash within our bank account after preparing for the bank reconciliation statements such as what you've seen in the previous papers and in the current year that the closing balance for cash is to be 150 so last year's catch is 100, but this year, 150. So this means there's an increase of catch and catch equivalents worth of 50 during the year. And hence, as you can see, when preparing this statement of financial position, we are particularly focusing on the closing balance of catch and catch equivalents in the current year. Or should I say, as at the year end. But when we are preparing for this statement of cash flow, we are more interested in why there's a fifty dollars of increase of cash during the accounting period. So that's the reason why we are going to prepare for this statement of cash flow. to show the reasons why there will be $50 of increase of cash and cash equivalents during the current accounting period. That's the reason why we prepared the statement of cash flow. Okay? So, under the ice number 7, either it will be single company statement of cash flow or the group cash flow statement, we are going to show three reasons
of why there will be an increase of $50 of cash and cash equivalents during the accounting period. So the first reason being because of the operating activities cash flow. So think about it this way. If you sell the product and get $100 of cash, okay, that will be the operating cash flow because it is something to do with your day-to-day -day running of the business. You buy or sell the goods and hence you spend the cash out, the cash coming in, so net them off, so that will be the operating cash flow. And alternatively, you're going to pay for some of the finance costs, which means it's the interest expense. Yes, that will be the operating activity because you have to, I mean, not you have to, but in most circumstances that the business will borrow money from the bank and hence operate its business. And hence we need to have, I mean, the loan, for example, we need to pay for the interest. So that interest payment needs to be included into the operating cash flows as well. Of course, there will be some other items such as the tax payment, the tax authority. Yes, that needs to be included into the operating cash flow as well. So that means, yes, operating activity. Uh, cash flow activity, for example, there will be $10 in to the business and hence we plus 10 over here. So that's the first reason why there will be a $50 of increase. The second reason being the investing activities cash flow. So that means it is something to do with your non-current asset section within your statement of financial position. So for example, during the year that you've bought a land and you spend, let's say, $20 out. So $20 out is the investment cash outflow that you spend. For example, you spend $20 to buy the land, so what you can do is to debit the land worth of 20 and credit the cash paid worth of 20. I can put 20 million dollars if you like. So that's it. So we're going to show the double entry that's related to the cash, for example, debit or credit, put that into a statement of cash flow if something related to cash. So in this case, investment activities, for example, related to non-current asset, not only going to include uh, the PPE, but also, for example, investment properties, intangible assets, and also financial assets. And also in the group statement of cash flow, it will include the goodwill, um, associates, joint ventures. I mean, all sorts of things included into the non-current asset section within the SFP. If it is related to cash, put that into the investing activities. That's it. And the third reason being... the financing activities cash flow. So if something related to the long-term liability and also the equity, that will be the financing activities cash flow. So for example, you go list it onto a stock exchange and then you get $60 from that. So that means you list your company and then you debit your cash and credit the share capital and also the share premium. So the debit cash worth of 60, put that there because it's related to cash for the accounting journal, yeah? So as you can see, if you sum up together that the movement for cash and cash equivalents would be $50. Okay, yeah, that's the reason why we split that $50 of increase in cash into three reasons, operating, investing, and financing cash flows. And as you can see, when we are preparing for this statement of cash flow, all we need to do is we're going to base upon the SFP that we've got, two years SFP, and also the current year's stamp of loss and OCI. So let me explain why. First of all,
based upon the SFP. So it's just, let me give you an example here. So it's the non current asset within the SFP under which we've got the property plant equipment. So for example, that's the property plant equipment that the opening balance this year. So that means if you look at the SFP for the PBA in the current year, at the start of the year that the opening balance is to be $50. And the closing balance, as at the current year's financial statement year end, is to be, let's say, $80. And that means during the year that the PPE has increased by $30. So if the PPE, or if any items within the SFP, from last and current year, there will be an increase or decrease this will be due to two reasons. So the first reason why it is an increase of $30 is because of the accounting reasons. For example, revaluation during the year. And hence revaluation, let's say, is $10 revaluation up. So the PPE has increased from 50 up to 60. But what about for the other $20 if increased then? Another reason is called the cash reason. Because during the year, though you spent $20 more to buy the non current asset, and hence raising the $60 of the PPE up to 80 So that means it's the cash out of this $20. So that means that you've debit the PP worth of 20 and credits the cash out worth of 20. So that's the reason why what we need to do from the SFP, we will only put this cash reason directly into the statement of cash flow. Okay, so that's the idea behind it. So in this case, because it's related to non-current asset, and hence we're going to put that 20 directly into the investing cash flow. That's the investing cash flow out, cash outflow. So that's the reason why we're going to, when we're preparing for the state, uh, statement of cash flow, it's based upon the SFP. It's the two years SFP. Changes in there will be two reasons. One is for accounting. We can ignore this. But one is for cash. We're going to extract that cash reason and plot that into the statement of cash flow. And that's the uh, idea behind it. And also, we need to also look at the statement of loss and OCI. Normally, in the exam, we are required to prepare, the state, prepare for the statement of cash flow is for the, um, I mean, using the indirect method to calculate the operating cash flow. And as a result of it, we are required to adjust the operating cash flow from the statement of loss. Normally, starting from the profit before tax within the statement of profit loss and OCI. And that's the reason why we're going to adjust for that. I mean, when calculating the operating cash, as you can see, as you can see here, it's the operating cash flow, there'll be two ways that we can do. Either it will be a direct approach. Simply, we are taking the cash in minus the cash out. Or it would be the indirect approach. That means we're going to reconcile those cash flow starting from the profit before tax. And we're going to do some other adjustments and you will arrive at the operating activities cash flow. So what do I mean by direct approach? Of course, it would be used by most, most of these small companies. So. I mean, what we can do is to calculate the operating cash. Simple. How are we going to do that? We're going to take the cash in minus the cash out. 
For example, saying the good, we've got a catch in of 30. Find the raw materials of the catch out of 10. Net them off, of course, is the net operating catch in, is to be $20. 30 minus 10. That's it. That's the direct approach. But in the exam, highly unlikely it will be a direct approach. But it would be the indirect one. So, the best way to look at this is to have a go at the pro forma. Okay, so we explain the basis and reasons why we're going to prepare the statement of cash flows already in your notes. And now let's see the sample of the group statement of cash flow in much more detail. Okay. So as you can see, first of all, we're going to detail the statement of cash flows into three reasons. The first reason is because of the operating activity, is the buying or selling goods. And then the second reason for this is because of the investing activities. That's something to do with the non-current asset within your SFP. And the third reason being your financing activities. For example, you issue some, uh, I mean, for example, convertible loan. So there be the cash. Okay, plot that into the financing activity. You issue some shares. Okay, you dare with the catch. Of course, plot them, plot them there as well. And then it will give you the movement of catch and catch equivalents during the year. So, for example, in the previous example, it used to be 50. We add them up together. So, what do I mean by catch equivalent? Is something that you can turn that into catch directly. For example, you invest in the government bonds, the short-term bond. And you can easily turn that into catch directly. Okay, that will be a catch equivalent. And, for example, that $50 can also be calculated from the balance within the SFP. So we simply use the closing balance for catch minus the opening balance for catch within your SFP. And that will also give you the movement of catch and catch equivalent. Okay, so that's... Uh, how we do, how we prepare for the statement of cash flow here. But in this case, we are going to prepare for the group statement of cash flow. So not only we're going to consider all sorts of items that is within the single company statement of cash flow, but also we need to consider the subsidiary, associate, joint venture, that kind of stuff. So now let's see then. How are we going to calculate the operating cash flow then? We are using the indirect approach here. So 99% of chance that you can get this in the exam. So indirect approach, as I said, we're going to adjust the profit to the cash. So we will start by taking the figure from the PNO for the group PBT, it's the profit before tax. And we're going to do two adjustments related to it. So why we're not going to take directly for the profit of the tax then? Of course, all we need to do then is we're going to say the profit of the tax is already uh, taken into account the tax expenses and interest expense. But not all of these tax expenses, as well as the interest expense, stand for the fact that we are going to pay for that actual amount during the year. Because think about the tax expense in the PNO, as I said, in the eyes number 12 income taxes, we just make the accounting estimate as at the year end. The actual payment in cash of those tax paid would be shown in the tax letter after the year end, right? So from that perspective, though, all we can do is we're going to take the profit before tax directly, okay, so to adjust for that. So, once we started from the profit before tax, we're going to adjust for two things. So first thing we're going to adjust is the non-cash item. Because we think, for example, in the P&L, we charge the depreciation expense. But if you look at the depreciation expense, double NG is debit expense and credit the PPE. We neither debit the cash nor credit the cash. And hence, it's nothing to do with cash, right? So what we need to do then, because we think, well, those items charged into the P&L, it just to be a non-cash item. What we have to do then, into our statement of cash flow, we have to adjust them back. So previously, we deducted the depreciation expense from the profit,
but now we're going to add it back because we think that those will not be the catch item. And hence, that's the reason why we're going to adjust for those adjustments. And secondly, we're going to adjust for the working capital as well because, I mean, think about the inventory receivables as well as the payable. I mean, why they will change from last year to this year. For example, the inventory is $30 last year, but $50 in this year. Why this is the case? It's simply because we spend the cash outs to buy the inventory, and hence we debit the inventory worth of $30 and credit the cash out worth of $20. So, uh, so if that's the case, then the credit the cash outs, plot that into the working capital adjustment to stand for the fact that this is a movement of inventory because of the cash reasons. So those are the two adjustments that we need to make based upon the profit. And then that will give you the gross cash from the operations. Are you going to minus the tax interest paid and minus the tax paid? Remember, this interest as well as the tax paid will be in a cash reason. So the interest paid, I mean the interest expense charged into the PL already, we can think about quite lots of things as being included. For example, the unwinding expenses, when you think about the leases, contracts. And also when you think about the ICE number 37 provision, when we capitalise that provision, we need to unwind it as well. Yeah. So those will be included in the finance cost and can call it as the interest expense. And also for some of the interest expense they haven't paid as at the year end. Okay, accrue for that. So that means those expenses that's not related to cash, because from the debit and credit, we can't see a cash item here. So what we can do is we're going to plot them back, first of all, into finance costs as the non-cash adjustment. And after we've done that, we only strip out the cash reason for those interest paid. So that means, for example, we actually pay for the interest expenses by creating the cash. Okay, we strip out those cash reason, plot that into interest paid over here. Same as the tax paid. Because as we all know, that as at the year end, we, according to ICE number 12, we have to provide for the accounting estimate of how much taxes we're going to pay for in order to matching with the benefit that we generate according to, according to the accruals concept. But as at the year end, that we debit the tax expense and create the current tax liability, we haven't seen the cash elements in there. We will pay for the uh, tax expense in cash only after the year ends when we receive the tax letter, right? So the tax pays in cash will be slotted at here only in cash element. That's the idea behind it. So let's see one by one then. First of all, for the non cash adjustments, first of all, as I said, we're going to add it back for any of these depreciation and amortization charges. Because for depreciation, we debit the expense and credit the PPE. For amortization, we debit the expense and credit the intangible asset. We neither debit or nor credit the cash. So we have to adjust them back because those are the non cash items that should not be deducted from the statement of cash flow. And then we have to adjust for those disposal of the non-current asset. So for disposal of the non-current asset, think about it in this one. Suppose we've got the PP over here, and we dispose of it, which means we sell the PPA, and we receive the cash in worth of $80, because we sell that, and hence cash coming into our bank account worth of 80 But that PPA is actually worth at $50. So that means we should sell it at 50 but we sell it at 80 And hence we make an accounting gain as the balancing figure worth of 30 So that's the accounting gain. So that accounting gain is not associated with the cash because the only cash element is related to 80 over here. So for that 80 we're going to plot that into the investing cash flow as coming into the organisation. So plot that here for the investing cash flow, the investing activity. 
is the proceeds from the sale of the non chrome tax act in this case is to be eighty dollars in and then for this PPA, because it's related to the SFP item, okay, we've justified that already in the working, for the PPE working, because all we need to do for the uh, SFP items, we're going to see the opening and closing, why is the change between these two? And then we're going to strip out the only catch reason, which is only 80 here, and plot that into a cash flow statement. And also, for this, Okay, worth of $30 because it's not cash, it's just to be the accounting gain. So what we need to do then is we're going to plot into the operating cash flow as the non-cash item adjustment. So that means, as you can see, because that we have already plots that third day into the uh, uh, statement of loss already. So that means it's a non catch item, we cannot plot that third day, and hence we deduct $30 into a non catch item adjustment. So that means any of this profit, you subtracted it. Any of this loss, you're going to add it back. Okay, so that's the. Uh, logic behind it. As I said to you before, we've got a finance cost as well. So in this case, when you are looking at the stain of loss, first of all you're going to plus all of this finance costs that you've charged before, plus them all back. Once you've plus them all back, absolutely fine. Because all you need to do then is you're going to subtract any of these interest that is paid in cash. So that means all of these finance costs, for example, in the PL. Let me just write down here. In the PL. So we've got the operating profit worth of 30. And then we've got minus the interest expense of finance costs worth of 20. I will give us the profit before tax worth of 10. Okay, so what we need to do then, first of all, we're going to plot all this $20 back here. And then after the analysis, we find out within that $20, only $5 will be related to cash paid to set to those inches liability. And as a result of it, we plus all 20 here, but the interest paid in cash is only worth at five. So what we need to do then, it's gonna minus five into the inches pay section. Okay, under the uh, cash generated from operations. That's the logic. Okay, let's see then. And also we've got the investment income as well. So that investment income is not associated with the cash. So what does that mean then? So suppose that you've got the investment property. So according to ice number 40, the accounting for that is going to put the gains losses for the investment property into the investment income or PL for short. So let's see, for example, that the opening balance for the investment property is to be $100 and the closing balance is to be $150. And hence there will be $50 of gain of that investment property during the year. And what we can do, the accounting entry, is we debit the investment property worth of 50 and credits the investment income worth of 50. And all we can do then is that we've credited the PL up by 50. But because the investment property increase in value, 
it's just to be an accounting treatment. It's nothing to do with cash because it happens sold it. If it happens sold it, that investment income cannot be recognized into the statement of cash flow. And that means we have to deduct $50 from the investment income section within the operating cash because it's a non cash item. Hope you're happy. And also we've got the impairment of goodwill. I mean the goodwill impairment, as you can see. For example, according to the IFRS 3, business combinations for goodwill, as you can see, that the, at the date of acquisition, the goodwill at the acquisition date is to be $60.00. And the goodwill as at the year end is to be fifty dollars. And hence there will be a balancing figure for this. Is for goodwill impairment worth of ten. And as a result of it, all we can do is to debit the impairment expense worth of ten and credits the goodwill. As you can see for the double entry, neither debit nor credit involves cash. And hence this is the non-cash item adjustment. Yeah, so we put this into your operating cash flow under the non-cash item adjustment. Of course this goodwill, we're going to adjust for that into working. So that means in this case it's to be 10 because we shouldn't charge that expense so we're going to plot them back worth of 10. Plus the impairment for goodwill. And also any items in impairment for the non-current asset, surely we're going to plot them that here as well. So example, this is impairment for the PPE. So for example, in this case, the PPE, not goodwill. That would be the same. We plot that 10 because it's the impairment related to PPE. It's not cash. And hence we plot them into the non cash item adjustment by plotting it 10. Okay, here. And also we've got the loss of profit on sale of the subsidiary. We are going to adjust for that. So, in this case, when we look at the changes in ownership for the group structure, we know that when we dispose of the subsidiary, perhaps that subsidiary is not a subsidiary anymore, that becomes the associate or perhaps it would be a simple investment, or perhaps we de recognize 100% of those. So we calculate the profit or loss of the disposable subsidiary by comparing that the total business at the date of disposal with the total things left at the date of disposal. I hope you can remember that. The total business at the date of disposal includes the cash in plus the reduction in NCI plus the remaining thing, so either it will be the associate or the simple investment, I'm going to subtract the goodwill at the date of disposal and subtract the net asset of the subsidiary at the date of disposal. So for example, it gives us the gain on disposal of shares of the subsidiary worth of 10. So if that's the case, if that's the profit, what we have to do, subtract it. Subtract 10 over here. If there's a loss on this both of the shares of the subsidiary, slots them back. Because that's just to be the accounting point of view. Because the only cash element is related to when you sell off that particular company, what is the cash in that coming into the company? We plot that cash into the company into the cash flow from the investing activity. So in this case, example dispose of the subsidiary that I can get the cash in worth 100 okay plot that here but for the netting balance the gains losses on the disposal we plot them into the non-cash item adjustment and finally we've got the share of associates profit or perhaps the share of the profit from the joint venture as well so that will be plots into the non-catch item adjustment. Well, the reason why this is the case is this. 
If you look at the associate or joint venture, we are using the equity accounting under the IS number 28. And of course, for the joint venture, it's under the IFRS 11. We'll talk about that in a second. So, for example, we bought that associate for 25% of shares. We spent $100 out. And during the year, that the profit of the tax of the associate is to be $200. And as a result of it, so that would be the share of associate's profit. And in this case, it would be in total worth $50. And hence, as at the year end, that the associate becomes 150 as the closing balance. And in this case, for that $50 over here, because the double entry, if you can remember, is we simply debit the investment in associate worth at 50. Are we going to credit the income from the associate only in the constated PL and OCI? Worth of 50 as the gain. So, from that perspective, as you can see, it's nothing to do with cash, yeah? Because debit is not cash and credit is not cash. And hence, for a credit size for income from the associate, we're going to adjust for that under the non cash item adjustments. But for a debit side investment in associate, plot that into SFP working. That's it. Okay. So, that means in this case, we're going to because we share of that profit already, we've charged that into the piano to increase up. Now we're going to reverse that effect. We shouldn't charge that in the first place. And hence what we need to do is going to subtract 50 here. So after doing all those adjustments, for the law and capture adjustments, okay, that's the first adjustment that we need to do. Quite a lot of this stuff going around here. Okay, I hope you're happy. Now, Let's look at the working capital adjustments. So working capital adjustments, from my perspective, that the best way to look at this is to directly have a go at the question called Amanda in your notes. So Amanda required is to calculate the cash movements for the working capital for the year. So as you can see, the working capital includes the inventory, receivable, as well as the payable. So let's see how we're going to deal with this. I mean, we are given the two years SFP for the opening as well as the closing. So let's see how we're going to do that then. First of all, I normally require my students for the working capital, or I can call it the WC. The working capital means... Something is working in order to turn that into capital. That means it's cash. For example, inventory is working in order to turn that into cash because we sell that inventory, get the cash. Receivable is working because we want to get that, turn that into cash because we want to collect the money from a customer, for example. And hence, working capital adjustments. So we include, first of all, for inventory, secondly, for receivable, thirdly, You've got a payable. So as you can see, we've got inventory supposed to be suitable, that's the asset, right? If it is asset, my approach is to use the opening balance minus the closing balance. Okay, so that's the first one. Any of these retranslation of the gains and losses, okay, plot that in. If this is a gain, plus if this is a loss, minus. That's the second one. Thirdly, any of these gains, uh, any of this acquisition or disposal of the inventory, so if the acquisition of the inventory or receivable plus, because it will increase the balance up, 
if we were to dispose of it, for example, we dispose of a subsidiary and get rid of that inventory, of course we're going to minus it. So that's the adjustments that we need to make related to assets as well as the uh, inventory as well as the receivable. So let's see then. First of all, let's focus upon these two. We've got the opening worth 400 and 200 for receivable. What about for the closing then? So closing, we've got 500 and 450. In the first place. So that means before we look at the gains losses because of a foreign exchange rate changes and also the acquisition disposal of a subsidiary. Now for inventory is a hundred dollars out. So that means the open balance of inventory is four hundred but closing is five hundred. We purchase a hundred dollars more of inventory during the year and hence it's the hundred dollars out of the cash outflow. And also for the receivable, as you can say, is $250 of the cash outflow. Why? Because at the start that we, that we should have received that $200 from a customer, but at the year end, we should have received that $450. So that means we should have received another $250 during the year, but we haven't. And that means we should have that cash within our company of $250, but it is not the case in this circumstance. And hence, in effect, it's like the catch out. We should have received that catch in, but we haven't. So that means it's the catch out, right? Okay, so that's the first of our two circumstances here. So as you can say, that the exchange gains or losses related to working capital. So you can say, for inventory, we retranslate that and it gives us the gain of 10, receivable a gain of 20. What does that mean? So first of all, we've got to plot that, plot that in first of all. So the gain is to be 10. And the gain for receivable is 20. So that means, as you can say, for inventory, we spend the $100 out during the year to increase the inventory from 400 to 500 in the first place. And because of the exchange rate gains losses, in this, year, in this case, it's the gain. So that means we don't have to spend $100 out to purchase it, but rather the net amount that we're going to spend is just to be $90. You agree? Because we should have spent $100, but because of a gain here, so that the net amount is just to be $90. Same as the receivable, for example. So we should have received another $250 from a customer, but now because of a foreign exchange rate gain worth of $20, so the net amount is just to be 230 because we have already received another 20 in the first place because of the exchange rate movement. So that's the logic behind it. Okay, so the gains losses, gain, plots them back, loss, subtract it. Okay. And also finally, we are told first of all, amount that has acquired a subsidiary with the inventory and receivable coming into your organisation, so 5 and 7, so we're going to plot them back, so 5 and 7. Because why this is the case is because that we acquired, we've bought the subsidiary, and hence we increased the inventory, we increased the receivable balance up by 5 and 7, okay, respectively. So that's the first circumstance. And lastly, Amanda during the year, has sold a subsidiary with the following inventory receivable balance of 3 and 2, we get rid of them. So that means we're going to minus 3 and minus 2 in the last circumstance. So in this case, as you can see, if we, uh, I mean, plots them all together, so that would give you $88. So that means for the inventory, so the net amount of cash out will simply be $88 million. A receivable is to be $225. So that means 
the net catch out for the receivable is just to be 2 to 5. Okay, so once you've got that, because it's negative, it's the catch out. Positive is the catch in. So because it's negative, plot them in into pro forma. 88 and 2 to 5. So inventory, 88 and 2 to 5 for the receivable. So as you can see, if there's an increase in inventory, yes, it's negative, because we spend the cash out to increase it. If there's a decrease in inventory, so that means we sold that and get the cash. So decrease would be a cash in. So in this case, because if it is negative, so that means the increase in inventory, and also increase in receivable here. So using my approach, by taking the opening minus the closing in the first circumstance, so that would give you that particular result directly. Okay. So now let's look at the payable then. So we go back to a question here. For this payable balance, so we're going to get rid of the receivable and inventory first of all. So we've got a payable. So for the payable, all we can do, set to pro forma again, but the second half of the pro forma will be exactly the same here. But the only change for the pro forma, for the payable, because it's related to liability, so all we need to do is we take the closing minus the opening, rather than the opening minus the closing. That's it. Simple. So that means, as you can see, we take closing minus the opening and then we plot or minus any of these gains or losses for the following exchange rate changes and then we plot the acquisition and minus the disposal So in this case, as you can see, the payable, the opening is 320 and closing is 300. So we take 300 minus 320. And also we are told because of foreign exchange rate changes that we end up with a loss for payable worth of 10. So because it's a loss, so we minus the loss worth of 10. And then because we acquire subsidiary, increase the payable up by $3. And we dispose of the subsidiary and get rid of $1 of payable. So minus 1. So in total, that will become... $28 of negative is the catch out. So we directly slot that $28 into our previous pro forma because it's negative. Okay, it's the catch out. So why this is the case then? So let's think about it. So payable is the short term finance for the company. So that means having this payable, that means we don't have to pay for the supplier right now. So at the start that we owed 320, but at the year end, we only owed 300. So that means during the year we debit the payable and create the cash paid worth of 20. And because of the exchange rate losses worth of 10, and that means instead of paying for 20, we now have to pay for 30. That means we have to pay additional for worth of $10 here. That's it. And we plot the payable worth of 10, so that means we still owe $3 to others. That's the catch in to the company, because in effect it's like a catch in, because it's safe as money, because we don't have to pay for them right now. And we minus the one disposal of it, because payable get rid of it, so that means we lose that opportunity to raise our finance worth of $1. In effect, it's like the catch out, because we have to set to it. So net them off using my pro forma. You don't have to see well it's the increase or decrease in payable. But in this case, because it's negative, so that means it's the decrease of payable because you lose that opportunity to raise your short-term finance. 
and hence that $28 will in fact would be the cash out. So once you've got that, as you can see, by reconciling from the profit before tax up to the second working capital adjustment, it will give us the gross cash from operations. We minus the interest paid to work for five, and then we also minus the tax paid here. But here's the thing. How are we going to work? How's that tax working then? So let me just remind you here. Tax. So in the exam, always start the working for tax. Starting from the tax liability. That would make our life that much easier. When you're looking at the SFP, for example, you've got the opening balance for in current tax payable. Let's say it's to, to be $20. So why this is the case then? Because that you've charged the current tax expense into the PNO. So the PNO for the income tax expense just remind you in the IS number, uh, IS number 12 income taxes, it will include the current tax expense, deferred tax movement expense, and also it will include the under or over provision related to last year's tax. And in this case, let's make an example, just to be $15 after calculating them. We directly take that into the p and because the profit before tax minus the income tax expense, okay, that income tax expense is 15, plot that here, taken to the PNL, from the PNL. So that's taken from the SFP, that's taken from the PNL. Uh, because I said to you before, the tax, for example, the PNL includes the current tax provision, oh, and also deferred tax. And also, what we need to do then is we're going to include the opening balance. For deferred tax liability and in this case for example another $15 and that will be taken from the SFP as well so if that's the case then all you need to do is to summarize them together okay so that will give you $50 and then once you've got that figure the next thing that you're going to do is to compare with the closing balance. So, first of all, we got, I mean, just to do the same thing again, so closing balance of the current tax payable. So, let's say it is to be $10, also closing balance of the deferred tax. Liability. So let's say it's to be twenty dollars. So if that's the case, then as you can see, that the closing balance is worth at thirty. So those will be taken from the SFP. So that means at the start of the year you owed fifty dollars to tax authority, but now you only owe thirty dollars. There's a reduction worth of $20 in the tax liability because all we need to do is we debit the current tax liability worth of 20 for example, I credit the cash paid worth of 20 So what we need to do then is we're going to include that $20 of the reduction in the current tax liability into a tax paid worth of 20. That's it. Some students would just to copy the PL worth of 15 into the pro forma there. Well, this is not correct because we are showing as a tax paid in cash. That's why we only include that 20 here. Right. Okay. So we finish off all of these operating cash flows already. Hope you're happy, just line by line. Now let's take a look at the uh, investing cash flow. As I said to you before, if something to do 
with the non-current asset section within your SFP, including your PPE, investment property, intangible asset, investment in equity instruments, um, financial assets, that kind of thing. Okay, plot them here if the movement of cash. First of all, is the purchase of a non-current asset. So the purchase of a non-current asset, so that means for PPA, let's say that you spend $80 buying it. So you debit the PPA of 80 and credit the cash paid worth of 80. So this needs to be including into the investing activity cash flows and that will be including the working Okay, to increase the PP up by 80 because of the catch reasons. So we include that 80 here. And then proceeds from the sale of the non-current asset, we talked about that already. And also we've got the interest received. So, for example, that we bought the debt instruments, for example, for the financial asset. And during the year, they received that interest at the coupon interest rate worth of $300 there. So simply, we debit the cash received and credit the financial asset worth of $300. Okay, that $300 because the cash received, plot that there. Okay, so let me put that down. For example, for this debt instrument, and from the buyer's perspective, we receive 300, so we debit the cash received, plot that into the investing cash flow, and credit the financial asset worth of 300 because we can't receive it at some point in the future. And from another party, the issuer's perspective, they've credited the cash out worth of 300 and debit the financial liability worth of 300. And that means we are standing from a buyer's perspective to receive the cash for those interest that we receive because at the coupon interest rate is the interest rate agreed in the contract. So we plot that there. Okay. And also we got the dividends received. Okay, because we bought the shares in the subsidiary or perhaps the associate, they decide to give me, I don't know, $300 worth of dividend. Okay, if that's the case, plot them there as well. But the best way to show this from my perspective is to have a go at the question in your notes called Ding Ding to see how we're going to deal with this dividend received from the associate. So required is to calculate the dividend received from the associate for the year up to 3rd of April 2015. So we are told that the year end is 3rd of April 2015 on this date that the investment in the associate is to be 750. So that will be a closing balance. Okay, slot that in first of all. Set to a pro forma, same as before. And the opening balance is to be 600 for that investment to associate. So during the year, if you convert 600 to 750, so what you need to do then is during the year that the income from the associate using an equity accounting method is 200. So the balance should be 800, but it has been reduced to 750. Why? because that you've paid the cash out to me. Worth of 50, pay the dividend to me in other words. So that means 800 minus 50, that gives the same 150. So in a group account, what we have to do is we're gonna credit the investments to the associate or the debit the cash received from the associate. So this would be the dividend paid from the associate to the parent. And what we need to do then for this 15, we're going to include that because it's the associate under non-current asset, include that into the investing cash flow 
for that 50. Going to plot 50 here. Okay, for dividend and receipt from the associate. And also, the acquisition of the subsidiary, for example, yeah. And in the previous example, the disposal of the subsidiary is the cash in, and the acquisition would be the cash out. So let's say, just make an example for the acquisition of subsidiary that we spend, uh, for example, $80 to buy that subsidiary. Okay, it's so the negative 80. Okay. So that's it. So total them up, it would be the cash flow from all of these investing activities. So that's it for the net cash in the investing activities here. So now let's look at the financing activities cash flow. First of all is the proceeds from issue of share capital. So let me just to give you an example. So within the SFP, under the equity section, we've got a share capital as well as the share premium. So for example, the closing balance for the share capital and the opening balance for the share capital as well as the premium. For example, $100 for closing, but opening is just to be 50. And then 50, and then 25. So as a result of it, how are we going to work out the cash related to shares then? So my approach is this. We simply use the closing minus the opening and plot them together. In this case, 100 minus 50, giving us 50. 50 minus 25, giving us 25. So in effect, it's to be $75 worth of cash in. All we need to do, plot that into the financing cash flow as the cash in. I mean, the idea behind it is very straightforward because as you can see, we credit the share capital worth of $50 and we credit the share premium worth of 25. So the balancing figure would go into cash worth of 75. So by using this approach, first of all, we directly take that 75 here. And secondly, using this approach, by using closing minus the opening and plots them together, we have automatically considered the bonus issue of shares. So bonus issue of shares is non-cash non flow because the bonus issue of share we simply dev the premium and create the capital. Nothing related to cash. And hence, by using this approach, we have automatically reflect this effect into a calculation, into the perpetuation of the financing activity cash flows already. So that's it. Proceeds from issue of shares. And then proceeds from the long-term borrowing. So that means we issue a long-term loan. So if we were to issue a long-term loan, so all we can do is with debit the cash and credit the long-term loan. For example, $30 received. So that means that we've sold that loan into the open market worth of 30 and received the cash worth of 30 from those investors. So we plot that $30 worth of cash directly into here. And then we've got repayments of the long term borrowing. So that means if it's to do with the repayments, the double entry is where we reduce that long-term loan, the long-term liability, let's say 30, and we credit the cash paid because we repay it. So that $30 of the cash paid out will simply be the cash outflow. Also, we've got dividend paid to the parents' company from the subsidiary. For example, we receive, let's say, $10.00 from a subsidiary, okay, plot them here. But what about for the dividend paid to those NCI then? Again, we are preparing for the group cash flow statements. We have to consider those NCI. And the best way, from my perspective, is to have a go at the question called DADA in your note. 
So calculate the dividend paid to NCI because NCI is associated with the equity. So we're going to put this cash flow directly into financing activities cash flow. That's it. So we are told the opening NCI is to be 24 and closing is to be 150. So all we can do is to use this pro forma again. The same pro forma. So opening balance for the NCI is to be 24. And then closing NCI is to be 150. So that means the change to the NCI during the year, we're going to compare that with the closing balance of NCI to work out the difference. So we are told is to be a 75% of shares of subsidiary, so the NCI percentage would be 25%. And the equity of subsidiary at the date of acquisition is to be 480. If we were to use the partial goodwill method, we times 25% of NCI, so that would give us 120 of the NCI value at the date of acquisition. So that means, I'm going to plot the NCI, worth 120 okay and then we're also told that the NCI charge in the PNL and OCI is to be 22 so that means this is the growth of the NCI during the year as a result of NCI percentage times the net asset changes for that subsidiary so because we plot that first of all into working for into our constancy SFP and secondly we charge that into the constated statement pot for loss and OCI. So in this case, we're going to plot the PL charge worth of 22. So that should give us a value of 166. But now the NCI is just to be 150. So think about the NCI is like the liability because that stands for the fact that this is the money owed by those shareholders who do not control the company. So that means, in effect, that we owed $166 to those shareholders who do not control the company. So if that's the case, then, we owe 166 at the year start, but now we owe 150 So that means that we paid the amount of money to them in the first place, worth of $16. So that means this is the cash outflow in the financing activity. That's the parents paid to those NCI worth of 60. So in this case, that we've debited the NCR by 60 and created the cash paid worth of 60. So in this case, because the reduction in NCI, so the dividends paid to the NCI worth of 60. Okay, it's the cash outflow. Okay, it's the reduction in the NCI. Sum up together, that will give us the net cash for the financing activity. And then total them up for the operating, investing and financing, and that will give us the movement in cash and cash equivalent. So that's just to make up a figure, let's say, $100. And then this will be the same when we are using the SFP balance to calculate this. For example, we assume that closing balance is 300 opening balance is 200 so 300 minus 200, that will give us 100 again. That will be the same when we plot OIF together, and that will be the same when we are using closing minus the opening. That's it. Just a reminder of the group statement of cash flow. So first of all, we need to show the operating cash flow by using the group Hall 54 tax and we do two adjustments in there. First of all, adjustments for the non-catch item. We're going to reverse the effect into the PNA. Secondly, adjustments for the working capital. And after we adjusted all of those bits and pieces, and that's what gives us the gross cash flow or the gross operation cash flow. We minus the inches paid in cash and minus the tax paid in cash and that's what gives us the net operational operating cash flow. 
that's how we do deal with the operating cash flow and then we are going to adjust for the investments investing cash flows that's something to do with the non current asset and then we're going to adjust for the finance and cash flow that's something to do with the long term liabilities was the equity within SFP sum up together that will give us the movement of cash and cash equivalent and that will be the same when we are using the closing balance minus the opening balance in the SFP to arrive at that movement as well okay so that's how we deal with the op, uh, deal with the statement of cash flow one final point before we move uh, before we move on to the full question is this for the group statement of cash flow or statement of cash flow this is under the eyes number seven uh, eyes number seven and uh, we're going to see whether or not the cash is healthy. So, for example, if we got the figure from the profit before tax is $30, if it turned out the net operating cash flow after adjusting for those issues, for example, is to be 25 So that means quite a lot of this profit can be turned into cash. So the, po so the ability to turn this profit into cash is very good. So it will indicate these financial statements will have a less likely chance to be manipulated by the management by using different accounting policies was the estimate. But if you find out that the profit is to be 30, but only $1 can be turned to cash, and hence you may think about, well, the company perhaps creative accounting. Yes, very likely to happen. And secondly, you can assess the investing cash flows. For example, if the investing cash flow is to be $1 million negative, uh, positive. That means that this company in the future may not be very good because the investing cash flow that means that you sold many of these non current assets during the year and hence you get um, the positive cash in. So normally if it is the negative cash out, okay, that would suggest the fact that the company, yes, is expanding its business. That would be good. Okay, so that's the uh, extra points I'd like to point out for the analysis of this statement of cash flow. I hope you're happy. So, that's how we finish off the group statement of cash flow. And in the next of our section, we'll see a full exam standard question of how we tackle this in the exam. So, see you in the next of our section together. APC, accounting for your future.